So we had a, a very good group that went around the world in 80 days. I'm sorry, 80 minutes. Uh, we, we had uh, folks from, from eight different countries, very diverse expertise, everything from, from uh, informatics and, and uh, metabolomics all the way through to a clinical application. Uh, one of the things that, that came out of the discussion was, first of all, that there's a lot of different priorities uh, for pharmacogenomics depending on where you sit in, in the continuum. And so there were uh, some themes that did arise. One of them is around the area of, of um, medications, uh, including uh, cheap medications uh, that, that really are associated with either treatment failure um, or extreme adverse drug reactions. And so we were able to hear from, from the, uh, for example, uh, Partha Majumdar in India uh, talking about how uh, cheap and cheerful metformin uh, is useful in some and, and uh, useless in many uh, in terms of the treatment of, of diabetes, but yet, yet we don't have a clue why, uh, or at least not as many clues. I think Alan Shoulder knows the answer, but the rest of us are still learning. Um, and, and so there's, there's work to be done in, in there. The folks in, in Thailand talked about um, how they focused in on adverse reactions cutaneous adverse reactions. It wasn't become, because either of them were dermatologists um, or intensivists in terms of the burn unit where these patients often end up, but rather there was uh, pharmacovigilance being performed identifying that these cutaneous reactions were a major cause of morbidity and mortality in their country, and they used this evidence-based approach to go after the mechanistic causes of these and then implement those mechanistic markers in, in the public health setting. And so there were some very nice lessons learned uh, from the, the uh, systematic approach that, that they took. So we, we put to, together a couple of, of items. Uh, we just we tried to put it all on one slide, partly because I was doing the typing and I did it in the, in the uh, five minutes before everything started, or actually the five minutes after everything started. Um, one is we wanted to really endorse the desire for quality of ev evidence base for <laughs> pharmacogenomics implementation. And uh, we knew that the evidence base group was going to say stuff along that line. But the, you know, people talk about pharmacogenomics as being the, the low-hanging fruit. And there are times when low-hanging fruit, fruit is not only easy to access, but is sweet and nutritious. And other times when it is easy to access and it's extremely sour and even poisonous. And, and so we, we need to have quality evidence to go after this low-hanging fruit um, cliche that we always use uh, to make sure that uh, there is time and ability to get to the high-hanging fruit, or uh, whatever the opposite of low-hanging is. Um, and, and so if we do it wrong with, with pharmacogenomics and some of these other uh, supposedly ready uh, areas, we will not have a chance to do it with the rest. And so um, I don't want to belabor that point. The emphasis on cheap drugs that have treatment failure, extreme adverse drug reactions, um, also includes uh, vaccine failure. And vaccines are, are not incredibly expensive, but have tremendous uh, public health impact. And uh, there are examples where the vaccines are, are very, uh, very useful, and others where there's a high degree of treatment of, uh, of prevention failure. Um, and so uh, that point was, was brought out. Uh, and and uh, the, you know, the diversity really was reflected in those points, because we, we talked about cholera, we talked about cancer, and everything in between. So uh, there's a, a, a lot of different areas where this, this could go. The, the, um, the next point I want to make was, was making sure that there is a drug or a pharmacogenomic component um, in the different federal, um, in, the, in the U.S. NIH efforts for uh, uh, stem, stem cell research, or I, iPS cells in particular. And the reason this was brought up is that there was a lack of, of basic science in pharmacogenomics, truly basic science in pharmacogenomics to drive a lot of the decisions that are being made. And you know, there's laboratory science going on, but a lot of it is not fundamental mechanistic basic science. And, and uh, the, the, uh, the point was brought up that in the neurology area, there is now going to be a um, more systematic initiative around generating iPS cells. Cardiology is, is, has, has done the same. So can we make sure that the, the, the drug uh, aspects are baked into the thought process from the start so that they can be useful as these collections are built um, and, and drive some of these? So for example, is it the same genes that mediate uh, drug-induced uh, uh, nerve toxicity to, uh, versus drug-induced um, uh, uh, the stomach cell, I'm blanking on the, the word, clonocyte uh, toxicity um, after the same chemotherapy agent? I mean, many drugs have mucositis and peripheral neuropathy as toxicity, 
we, we just assume it must be all the price of doing business. There, there's probably some things that could be learned, but we just don't have the, the, the tools. The second to the last thing I want to mention is that there's, there's a need for global uh, efforts around the development of value, the value <coughs> proposition for next generation sequencing in cancer. This is something that's happening in many parts of the world. It's, it, was, um, it was the key point brought up by our colleagues from Korea um, when, when asked to, to say what their priorities are. Um, it, as well as um, our colleagues at the NCI and other parts of the U.S. It, it's something that people are doing. But often what's happening is you know, people talk again about cancer as being the other. You know, pharmacogenomics in general, cancer in particular, are the answer. That's where it is. Well, if you see how next generation sequencing is being applied in the clinical setting currently, it's patients that are treated with first-line therapy from randomized trials, second-line therapy <coughs> using data generated from randomized trials, and then, oh crap, we don't want to do, and I really like this lady, uh, let's sequence her tumor and hope that we can find some concoction to put together to treat it. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not a lot, um, because it's, it's, uh, you know, it's the modern version of, of, uh, of best guess. Um, because we're using next generation sequencing, therefore it must be true. Now, the reason why this is a big deal is not only because of the potential harm and benefit to the patients, but it's an expensive test, relatively speaking, that generates the use of a very expensive set of drugs. So uh, we, one example that was brought forward was the finding of, of an ALK um, uh, amplification in uh, a gastrointestinal cancer where the $5,000 test led to an $80,000 drug, neither of which would have been normally used in that clinical setting. And so there, there are some, some work. And the problem is global, so, so could there be a global initiative to try to tackle this? Also, the sample size needed to tackle this is going to be large. Um, and, and so there, there could be some efforts there. And then the last thing I want to, want to mention from our group as, a, as, a, as an output priority item, and you'll, you'll notice that, that these are relatively vague, except when you get down to the last two. But the last one was really um, riffing on what the, the folks from East Asia had developed um, in terms of the strong data that the, 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 the Thai colleagues had presented, um, plus the confirmation from Singapore, from Korea. Uh, we know what the, what the Taiwanese have, have done from their, their papers. Um, and that is that in, in many parts of the world, all of the cases, or nearly all of the cases, of Stevens-Johnson syndrome and the related syndrome 10 to, can, can be predicted uh, preemptively by genetics. Some of the rest of the world can be predicted as well, based on the, the data from Liverpool and others from that we saw in New England Journal about a year ago. So, per, Prediction of drug-induced or carbamazepine in particular induced uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome is there. And so Alan coined the term global eradication of Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which is a, obviously a very emotive way of saying, you know, can we just force this issue? Uh, it, it, you know, when he said that term, it just, you know, there was this, this, uh, this natural reflex of getting behind it and trying to do something. And the, the concept of pharmacogenomics globally eradicating anything is kind of is kind of cool, um, and and so it certainly was a, an uh, interesting idea to think about. You know, can we use this in that sort of in that sort of way? And so um, I I took a, a hour and a half or hour and forty five minutes and con concentrated into one slide and a few minutes of talking. Uh, but I want to thank my group and and off and ask them uh, if anybody in the group wants to add anything before Mark. All right, over to you. I, I just you. think, uh, imagine the headline from this meeting, you know, international group convened by NHGRI agrees to eradicate Stevens-Johnson syndrome. I think that's awesome. I think it's a spectacular idea. The reason that I really like this is because it's one of the few instances where um, uh, we don't have to deal with all the other messy stuff like efficacy and, you know, the balance between adverse events. And it's a very pure prevention phenotype. I, I think that's a really spectacularly great idea. One, one of my first graduate students was named Steven Johnson, and he hates <laughs> any idea to do with this. So like, but I think the rest of the world, the rest of the world will love this. So. <laughs> Other questions, comments, additions? Let me uh, let me just uh, ask um, you know sort of so uh, I I also agree with your uh, with the global eradication notion as being uh, really um, uh, compelling uh, but um, uh, would there be uh, something that uh, you would I I I, I like the I also idea of the whole of the whole pharmacogenomics card uh, which may um, not eradicate anything 
but it um, may uh, provide some opportunities. And I'm just wondering if, uh, if you had a chance to think about um, other ways that that kind of concept could also be deployed. Yeah, thank you for, for bringing it. I meant to, to mention that as part of it. So one thing I would suggest to any of you that are um, organizing workout groups in the future is get Heidi uh, to be one of the co-leaders because then she helps you get everything organized ahead of time, including this two-page handout that we had. Um, and then she got seconded to lead another group, as you just heard, and another group. So basically, I showed up, I had a two-page handout already and everything like that, all thanks to Heidi. So that's one, one point. One of the things that, that, uh, that Heidi and I put together was, on, on the second page here, was a list of all our favorite pharmacogenomics examples. Germline examples, somatic examples, infectious examples, whether they had CPIC guidelines, whether the FDA label had been changed, all that kind of stuff. And we brought up the idea, should we uh, spam this group uh, with a, a survey monkey or one of those things to say, which of these are being used in your country, rarely, commonly, that sort of thing. There, there wasn't a, a high degree of enthusiasm um, about, about that around the table. There's a few, a few of us that were excited about it, um, but, but not universal excitement about it. So we, I didn't put, it didn't make the list. But the idea was to take that data, to use it to help, for example, di uh, drive which CPIC guidelines get, uh, get prioritized, because they're of global importance, but also to use that as a way of building up a, a, some content that could allow each country to make their own version of the Thailand top 10 pharmacogenetic things for your patient card, uh, hopefully with a little clever, more clever name than that. Um, where, you know, because certainly what was put together by the, the group in Thailand was fantastic, but would not necessarily resonate in my practice. Um, and there'd be another set that would be more. So um, that, that definitely was on the radar. And uh, actually the, the, the folks in Thailand and I talked as we were leaving the room that there was enough interest, the minority interest, that we'll wait until people are less tired <laughs> um, and then ping them again and, and see if we can do that. Because I think it would be an, uh, an easy output uh, that could really help some people. Very descriptive, but still easy. Uh, well, I think we, okay, we think, uh, is, is there any doubt that the uh, eradication of Steven Johnson syndrome is the highest priority? Well, I, I think, uh, I think it was, it's certainly a very high, uh, priority and, and certainly achievable in some parts of the world. Um, there, I mean, there, there were some folks in, in the room, I don't think anybody was against it. There are some folks that because of their own practice area or, or interest had, had some other, you know, wouldn't necessarily resonate. Um, I think, you know, another one that, that came up and uh, was around the vaccine example. Again, you know, I don't know how one eradicates uh, uh, vaccine failure. It's certainly a bigger issue. but. Uh, there, you know, there are concepts there, and, and you know, va basically, vaccine pharmacogenomics has been pretty neglected. I mean, you know, Parth has a few things, a few others. You've done some stuff, but not much. Uh, well, um, we're trying to also be as focused as we can on clinical implementation yeah. of things that look like they're validated versus discovering new things. Not that that's not important. Right. I, I was just going to make one quick point on the global eradication. The fact that um, Is there a microphone there. So, oh, this doesn't work. Okay. Oh, okay. I was trying to think if it would. This one works? Okay. Uh, and, and that is, is that in the other parts of the world where we don't quite have a handle on all the variants, that this same project can have a discovery uh, aim to it, and that uh, it's very rare, but across the globe, we can amass enough uh, subjects to actually figure it out. Yeah. And, and for example, uh, George Petrinus has, has left, uh, left for the airport, but uh, I know he worked with Michael Lee, um, who's now at Recon for me at, at, uh, in Taipei. Um, to develop a, you know, kind of Eastern Europe version of, uh, you know, collecting uh, Stephen Johnson tins. And so there's, there's little things out there that, that could, be, could be used independent to the, Euro, uh, the European Union funded efforts that are also there. Um, I want to also mention that uh, our colleague Godfrey from, from Malta has not only been, been following this by, uh, he wasn't able to travel because of some, some um, commitments over in, in Malta, uh, but has been following this and got on by Skype. So we actually had members on via Skype uh, in terms of our breakout group. So I wanted to thank him for that uh, since he's been an invisible part of the meeting. Yeah. The one other thing I just want to add about the, the, the um, Stephen Johnson thing is it would give us a chance to test out in a very delimited environment defining an, uh, you know, uh, nomenclature standards on for reporting and sharing data. Um, uh, because there are, in fact, some defined codes. And, and so it would, it would allow us to dip a toe into the water to some of these other 
thorny problems that um, when we think about in the big picture would, are difficult to approach, but this may give us some ideas of can we in fact work together to come up with solutions for each of the different pieces that would be necessary to implement a program of that type. Marie did, did mention that uh, doing a quick Google search of Stevens Johnson syndrome uh, for, for images for a talk he was going to give brought up not only some very emotive images of, of blistering and you know children that needed uh, a lot of help, uh, but also lawyers that were willing to, to sue the, your prescriber on behalf of, of their firm. Um, and, and so you know, there, whether that's a good or a bad thing was, was part of the discussion. Uh, Fod looks like. Just how, how strong is the evidence um, that you can predict? Stephen yeah, so, so Fod's question was uh, the strength of the evidence around that. So that for that particular example, there has been a uh, prospective study. There was a uh, pay, set of papers in New England Journal, I believe it was last year, maybe the year before. No, no, I, I don't um, care about what. I'm yeah. Um, yeah, there is prospective evidence to say that you will, um, in, at least in Taipei, they eliminated the problem. Um, according to the data from Thailand, it'll account for uh, about 90% of the cases. I mean, it's, it's something that, it's, it's you know, stronger. yeah, it's, certainly it's, it's not as good as the polio vaccine, uh, but better than the flu vaccine. <laughs> I, I do agree with all the problems with the Stephen Johnson. I don't think it should be the headline or the one-liner about this meeting, because then it would look like if we're desperately looking for something in favor of a clinical utility of pharmacogenomics. And that would be weird. I don't think this should be the one-liner. Yeah. All too often we've told the public that we can do anything in genomics and we shouldn't fail this time. We've done, we failed with gene therapy 15 years ago. We shouldn't fail again. And this looks like we're desperately looking for something <laughs> where we can help, and this is not yeah. true. I, I think uh, we're deluding ourselves to think there will be a headline from the, from the meeting in terms of outside people outside this room, but, but uh, I, I get your point. <laughs> Earlier in the day, isn't that right? I think he's been burned. <laughs> <laughs> but he also brought up that he's a street fighter. So well, <laughs> I, th I think we shouldn't underestimate the power of the of the public. Angelina Jolie, Jolie has done more to breast cancer prevention than any other program. We've seen doubling of our number of requests, and then the primary care physicians don't know how to answer the question of the patients that come in because they know about Angelina Jolie. So that's an answer to Bruce's thing that, like, yes, we need a tree of them. So don't underestimate the public. <laughs> Last uh, breakout report will be from Laura Rodriguez.